So um, I want to say how grateful I am to be here and to be able to uh, learn more about the context that you face and that's faced in the UK for farmers and for the organic movement here. And what I'm hoping to do in this talk is to help give you a, an understanding of how we as IFOAM view the organic movement and where it's going and what its context is now and to use that as a lens to uh, and with the context that, that you're facing here because there is a lot of resonance on the different levels. Uh, our mission statement is that we lead, unite, and assist the organic movement in all of its diversity. And it truly, there are a lot of approaches to uh, realizing the organic mission and to fulfilling the principles of organic agriculture. And uh, we have a lot of work to do. Anybody who uh, looks at what's happening in the world realizes that uh, we can't quite keep going how we are now, and we are part of a dominant agricultural and economic paradigm <laughs> that um, we may not have thought or we may believe all along that, that it's not really working, it's not really where we want to go. And I can tell you that I was at, in November, we had a Sustainability Days event where we worked on some of our projects, and I will speak about them as well, uh, just to give you a little context about what we are doing uh, with and for the organic sector. But uh, there was a SUSCON event there, which was really, uh, there were very few organic people in the room. Um, I was one of them, there were a few other operators, and it was mostly the agricultural sector, but there was also forestry and fisheries and some broader businesses, um, largely from the conventional sector. And it was very interesting uh, to me to hear from all of those people that the paradigm we have isn't working and that we had better acknowledge that and we had better do something about it or we're really going to be in for a shock. Um, we know that the current system that we're all part of, uh, even in the organic world and the econ economic system that we're in right now, relies on cheap energy and we know that it's becoming a lot less cheap. We know that it's running out. We don't know exactly when that crisis is going to hit us, but it is going to hit. The writing is on the wall. The question is, uh, will it hit us all evenly? Will some of us face it differently? What are we going to do about it? Just shining on the problem is really going to um, not help us in the long run. Also, what we see in our global economic paradigm, it really is a somewhat of a top-down approach. You know, when my daughter is uh, 17 years old now, and when she was born, I thought, what have I done? I have brought this child into this screwed up world, and what kind of unspeakable horror is she going to see after I'm gone? And then I realized, you know, that unspeakable horror is already happening. It just hasn't reached my blessed corner of the world yet. And for most of us in the developed world, we can only really think about that as an abstract concept. But if you go to some of the more troubled places of the world, you realize that really is already happening. And it's happening for economic reasons. It's happening for uh, climatic reasons. It's happening for a variety of reasons. And they may not have hit us yet, but we may face those. Right now, the way the global agroeconomic uh, model works essentially is, for lack of a better term, the first world starves last. Right? We have the resources, we have the economic might. That is actually starting to shift because we have the emergence of very strong economies in the developing world where, that they're, where they are either human resource and or resource rich, like Brazil and China and India. And I think the reality is that if you look now at you know, who maybe the 20 most powerful companies in the world are, if we look 10 years down the road, we don't even know who some of those companies are going to be yet. They're out there, and the reality is that there's a lot of hungry people, there's a lot of industriousness happening in these other nations, and that balance is going to shift. And it, it, it may not shift to our advantage, if we say. It, it, there will be more of an equalizing effect. All this idea of we need to feed the world, yes, we do need to feed the world. Um, under the current paradigm, I think it is a relatively clear observation that 
Hunger is still increasing. We have more poor people in the world, even though there are, there's a lot of food in some places, like in the United States where I live. We have the fattest people and probably one of the most unhealthy fed populations. Uh, there's problems with fresh water quantity and quality. Biodiversity continues to be lost at a rampant rate. We're losing soil fertility. And energy continues to be uh, scarcer and scarcer and more and more effective. So everybody there was saying, we know this is all happening, and we need to shift the paradigm. And if there was any talk about what it would be, the only answers that actually came out were that it should be organic. Now, a lot of people don't really want to admit that because they don't want to go there for a variety of reasons. Right? But there are fundamental differences in the organic paradigm, and I don't have to preach to you, the choir, about why organic is better. So I won't really do that. But I do think it's important for us to be able to speak to people who don't really understand a lot about organic. So they say, what's really the difference? And there are some qualitative differences in how this is a paradigm-shifting approach. We don't use biocides in general. We, our, our practices favor life and favor living systems and work with these living systems and rely on the resilience and the energy of the earth and the sun as opposed to trying to conquer it with, uh, with our uh, uh, inventions, shall we say. And um, we also try to reduce our dependency on external types of of, of resources and be able to become much more um, self-sufficient. Those are some basic differences. But we also have to realize that for the most part, organic producers and farmers and marketers are still existing in the same global or general economic paradigm. Right? The organic sector is not perfect. <laughs> and we have a lot of work to still do to become more sustainable ourselves. Uh, we are challenged both from within and from without. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk during this conference about all the organic bashing that's been ha that's, that, that we're receiving. And that's a constant battle. And we'll always have to try and answer those things. Uh, those, that bashing usually comes from people who have some particular interest or slant about why organic doesn't work. They don't mm -hmm. want to go there. Some of them may be actually really concerned that it's not going to be a solution. But a lot of times it comes from very vested interests in the other paradigm. Uh, but in reality, the, the all the talk about sustainability that goes on is de facto admission that what's happening is not sustainable. And uh, so we, we just need to, to keep that in mind and understand where that bashing um, actually comes from. Um, one of the other differences that we talk about, and I'll go back a slide here, is we talk about supply chains in our dominant system. In, 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 our, in our context in the organic world, we tend to talk a little bit more about value chains and about what's the value along the line from producer to consumer and how is the value transmitted and, and merited along the way. But our challenges are, some of the challenges we receive from without is we're seen as elitist, we're seen as not scalable, we're seen as expensive, we're seen as a fringe, a luxury item. Um, we're, we're challenged on our yield. And we're also um, told that to actually enter the market, it's too onerous and it's too bureaucratic. And quite frankly, uh, some of these challenges are truer than others. Is it not scalable? I don't believe that's true. If you look in Russia right now, where most of the food is produced by smallholders, there's a very good examples of how organic can actually be scalable. But we need to reposition where we are in the market. There's lots of other sustainability initiatives which have been born primarily because of the success of the organic market. Here's some seals that maybe you're used, used to seeing in, in the UK. This is just a sampling. There's hundreds of eco-labels out there. And uh, you know, what people say to us is that, is that, oh, you're organic. You're the top. You're the best. Isn't that what you want? And we say, no. What we want to be is the base. We want to be the base on which, or the core around which, sustainable production, sustainable systems are built. We don't know everything. We don't have all of the answers. 
we need to continuously improve what we do to improve our own yield, to make it so that we're more efficient, so that we reach more people, and so that we actually can uh, show that we can actually feed the whole world. There's not only one solution, though. We are trying to forward the, uh, uh, promote organic practices and systems in all of their diversity. The systems that you come up with versus the systems that they, people come up with in Ethiopia, the United States, or Russia are all going to be context specific. Um, but in order to, re, when, when we talk about repositioning ourselves, what, what IFOM is, has been uh, receiving as a mandate from its membership, and we are a membership organization, is that we should try to put organic back into the mainstream and show people that really this is the mainstream approach to sustainability. Right? means we need to admit where our shortcomings are and say, yes, we understand it's not perfect yet, but at least here's a solution that does have a potential long-term viability. On the other hand, when we say the other paradigm doesn't look like it has a long-term viability. So what we've tried to do then is create an action network to uh, try and get our thoughts together, essentially, and have a unified approach. And one of the results coming out of our Organic World Congress a year ago in October was to create an action network. And so we started to do that. And these are some of our founding organizations. We actually have members uh, of, a, of an advisory group as well, some from the Organic Research Center as well, to help us form our ideas. We're actually ready to go out to the, uh, to the world with, with what we've come up so far and have a public consultation on our ideas. Um, this, is, this is just a, a, something that happened at Suscon. Uh, Helmi Abuleish, who is the managing director at Sekim, which is a, a really pioneering organic organization in Egypt, said that the green economy is going to come. You know, and it's either going to happen by wisdom or by crisis. My sense is that it will probably happen by both, depending on where you are and what your, situations, your situation is. Um, our goal is to try and take it in a more proactive sense and try to spread the principles of organic agriculture to use different solutions from around the world and to actually try and share the learning that we've had so that you can apply what we learn in other places and those people can apply what, what you're learning as well. Regardless of where you are or what kind of paradigm you're in though, there's certain things that everybody's gonna have to look at. We need to address the energy needs Right? Prepare for crisis. Right? If, if you think that somehow your fuel costs are not going to unbalance your budget, you're probably living in a dream. So how are you going to, how are you going to uh, either innovate new sources of energy or find less reliance on them? Right? How are you going to actually, and, and if those systems break down and your input supply from China or Brazil or France or wherever it's coming from is not here, what are you going to do? What are you going to produce? Finding more ways to get products to market so that you as a farmer can survive is really important. Our, one of our number one goals really is to keep farmers in business. Farmers are almost like an endangered species in some, uh, in some countries. It, certainly in my country, in this country, it's you know, looking more scarce all the time. So trying to find ways in which you can stabilize your own economic base. And you know, as the saying goes, you don't put all of your eggs in one basket. If you can find more ways to market your products, that is a way to help assure your stability. Um, we also talk about shortening supply chains. Right? You know, and in, in, in the UK, this certification is kind of the de facto entry to the organic market. But certification is really only a means to an end. And it really only exists because the producer and the consumer don't know each other, right? It's a proxy for trust. If you, can, if you can shorten the supply chain and make that connection, then all of a sudden, some of the needs of certification start to diminish. And some of the actual loss of value or the sharing of value across the chain starts to become more, uh, more assumable by yourself as a farmer. The fewer links in the chain generally, the more money you get. Um, so we, you know, in addition to 
keeping farmers alive economically, what we talk about is making sure that they really, they have reasons to stay on the farm. It's profitable enough. Where they live is a good place to live. It's culturally diverse enough. It's rewarding. Uh, in, in, uh, in some places uh, in the world, that's really an issue. People flock away from farms for a better way of life elsewhere. Um, our job is to help figure out ways in which people can stay on the farm. Um, so um, we're trying to be inspirational and guiding and as aspirational. Um, five minutes? OK. We're going to, uh, uh, our, our goal is to try to help demonstrate, uh, uh, help people demonstrate the leadership of the organic movement and, uh, um, and ultimately to show in a tangible way that what we're doing is really uh, a benefit. Um, the way we are, one of our first steps in this action effort is to develop a best practice reference, which will be essentially a conglomeration of the ideas, a unification of those ideas that we can rally around and then start to um, build upon. Um, and we'll use them also and, and the proof of our research to uh, use it as a political tool to show the benefits of organic agriculture. And then ultimately what we're trying to do is wrap these into a community of best practice so that this information sharing can happen so that farmers can learn all of the different solutions that are possible. We divided sustainability into five dimensions right now. This discussion is ongoing. It's a very complex subject. Right? And one of the things that we're trying to do to reposition organic as a mainstream relevant approach is to show that it's not only about not using chemicals or soil stewardship, but it takes into consideration the full realm of sustainability uh, issues that the world is talking about. And so we have social or societal ones, ecological ones, economic ones. Uh, the cultural aspect is somewhat unique to the organic sector. And a lot of people ask me, well, what's the difference between culture and society? And I guess the best distinction I can be is that the societal dimension is about equality, whereas the cultural dimension is about individuality and diversity and leadership. Where's the inspiration that individuals and their communities get for doing what they do? And what we say is if you want to be sustainable, you've really got to actually talk about all of these things. We've broken them down in our reference into a set of different aspects that allow people to assess whether or not, you know, in detail, how they're going to use these or address these in their context. So I'm going to have to rush through a little bit here. But here's the presumption. You've probably seen all these spider graphs. Right? Nobody's perfect, right? but the presumption is that if we employ best practices, best practices would essentially be the perimeter of the spider graph. Right? Nobody is there yet, and everybody will approach the perimeter in different ways, but that the best practice would lead to sustainability. And this hallmark of continuous improvement of our sector is something that, we're tr that we need to communicate and we need to share with uh, Especially, not only within ourselves, but to the sectors which is the 98% of the world, which is not organic. Uh, we're going to use this best practice for a variety of uh, uh, our document for a variety of purposes. I won't go into this now, but my presentation will be available for you later. Um, thinking about how you do it here is we're, what we're looking for is for people to start employing these practices and then to really start sharing what they're doing and communicating with each other about it. One of the things that we have seen is that there's not one silver bullet to any one situation. You can reduce your input costs. You can try and bump up your production. You can try and uh, make your energy a little bit more efficient. But every farm, every operation is different and has its own combination of attributes. And some of the best ways that farmers learn is by looking at other successful stories and understanding, oh, you know, I can borrow that for mine. I can borrow that for mine. And I can share this with somebody else. So we try to share information. And we try to spread that information into the market. And then, in turn, also talk to people who pull the strings of policy so that we can get them to support organic practices more. Our remit only goes until we sell the product. And as Nadia was talking about this need to produce more product, is imperative. But one of the things we also look at is all the waste that happens in the world. They say something like half of the food in the world is actually wasted. And so we need to somehow affect consumer behavior as well. We don't know the answer to that. But it is something that we continue to ask and are hoping that we'll be able to have some more uh, 
uh, impact on as time goes by. It may be price, it may be just utter scarcity. Um, when I'll, I'm just about done, Mark. So, um, when we prove our case, there's a lot of talk about metrics, about indicators, and uh, we've just we've debated this issue a lot. How do we actually prove our case with hard numbers to policymakers so that they actually believe that what we're doing is reasonable and has some hard evidence to it? And what we have to understand is that when we talk about metrics and indicators, that we have to understand what purpose we're using them for. I can have a lot of details to it so that I can troubleshoot my own operation and figure out where I'm falling short, where, where I am uh, inefficient, where I'm successful. But when I try and communicate that in an aggregated sense to say this kind of organic practice or organic practices are worthwhile for water stewardship, for, for productivity, for cost benefits for farmers, we have to aggregate those into a completely different set sometimes of metrics. And so we have to be clear when we develop these things if we want to help farmers versus we want to influence the cap, uh, how we actually choose those metrics. Um, ultimately, we have this community of best practice that we're starting to envision. And again, some of the things that I would point out here is that we'll have a place for leaders and for case studies to really show people what's going on so that we can have this information exchange occurring. Because this is about learning, it's about innovation, it's about continuous improvement. Ultimately, we have to show that what we do is a good start, what's our absolute performance, but then where are we actually going with it? So that was far more of a rush than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I hope I got across enough of a message. Thank you.